Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Hi, I'm Jason, with Jason Pollock. I am not Jason. Joining Jason today is one half of the hilarious podcast, Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. Performing at a comedy club near you, national headlining comic, Mark Riccadonna. Now, the man you haven't been waiting for, Jason Pollock. Hello, my name is Jason Pollock, and this is the sixth episode of Hi, I'm Jason. I thought a simple name like that would be making it easier for me to remember, and I forgot. Because I had the name of our guest, Mark Riccadonna's show in my head. And I almost said, hi, this is Jason Pollock with drinks, jokes, and storytelling. But that's not my show. That would be Mark's show. But in the meantime, I'm going to bring up my co-host and musical band leader extraordinaire, Justin Gonzalez and the Kitty Cat Orchestra. Welcome everybody to Hi, I'm Jason. I'm not Jason, that guy is. Welcome to Hi, I'm Jason. That was amazing. I and that. that that is available on your record label. Uh, it's track number three in your new CD. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, uh, it's People I Touched on the Subway is the name of the album. Uh, I used listen, to. That's what I. That's what it's about. Listen, I don't want to cut you off, but we have an awesome guest today. We, no, we've had some up. great celebrity guests. Now we've got this guy. Um, that, that, that could be considered a dig. Just saying, we've I'm had some kidding. wonderful celebrities, and now there's this guy. <laughs> Mark is one of the most likable people you'll ever meet. Ever, I've known him for years since the Rascals days. He's doing a show. He's he's a solid headliner, and he's doing a show now with Richie Byrne that's also very funny because they're two likable guys. What more can I say about them? It's called Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling, which is not my show. That's Mark's show, and I'm gonna bring him on, Mark Riccadonna. <laughs> and Jason, you are the best. <laughs> I, Justin, I hope you're enjoying every second of being with Jason as much oh, as you stop should. Stop it. You have no idea, my friend. When we met, uh, Jason and I met years ago uh, at the Julia uh, Julia Scotty Comedy Test Kitchen, and oh, yeah. uh, and I, I I knew then that uh, that I had I had met a special person, and uh, uh, and, and I knew that because of the helmet he was wearing. But, uh, <laughs> Jason is one of these guys that I'm telling you, if he had a, a British accent. He'd be the most famous person on television. <laughs> That's the biggest compliment you could have ever given me. I grew up with British comedy. People have no idea how funny he is. Wow. They gloss over it. And there are some people that get on the right tuning fork level and just <laughs> appreciate every single second of Jason. I'm going to start billing myself as a British comedian. You should. You should. Did we, did we did a show at Pocahontas. Uh, Pocahontas. <laughs> what, what a gal. We did a show at Pocahontas with you, Mark. And and there's a guy there who was doing an Irish accent. Oh, he was yeah. doing a brogue. <laughs> and then afterwards, he, he just – he jumped out of the Irish – which he did very well. He jumped out of it and said, I'm really Tony blah, blah, blah from Brooklyn. <laughs> Nobody gave a shit. They're like, oh, yeah. why'd you do the Irish accent? Okay, and? <laughs> yeah, that was weird. <laughs> the, usually he was expecting to get like a big applause or like, oh my God. It was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do next? <laughs> like that would be my worst fear as a magician. <laughs> oh God, like that's the trick? You do like this like yeah. amazing trick and here's the card. And they're just like... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought this was a dove act. <laughs> I'm really waiting for a dove to appear. You all you did is pick my card. That's it's not magical. That was just a good coincidence. <laughs> Mark, thank you for doing the show, man. Thanks for having me. Do you watch do you know who Matt Barry is? No. Um there's a show that called What We Do in the Shadows. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, I know he, what you're talking he's about. He's the one who talks like this. You know what I'm <laughs> talking about? He's like, yes. Hey. And he was in the IT crowd. He was the uh, boss. Oh, yeah. Yes. He's a comic. And, dude, if you and him were on tour, it would be the funniest thing I've like ever. And Zach Galifianakis could be the Southern. <laughs> you are so good for my self-esteem. <laughs> I think I could do a TED Talk. If I if I had a, a TV show, I would have the three of you, Zach Galifianakis, Jason Pollock, and Matt Barry, just try to outweird each other. Outweird <laughs> each other. <laughs> it would be 22 <laughs> minutes of them outweirding each other and me just going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time, I, you know, I am self-conscious because I see people do live Facebook shows all the time and all this live stuff. And I. My initial reaction is nobody wants to see you that close. I hate you. Nobody yeah. cares what you have to say. Now I'm doing a podcast, one yeah. of these, and now I'm thinking everybody's looking at me like nobody gives a shit what you have. That's why I call it a hi, I'm Jason, because people are going to say, who is this guy? It's right there. <laughs> it's right in the title. It is. And that's yes. Justin. <laughs> in parentheses. So, Justin, you grew up northeast Philly. Yeah. Yeah, and then you go to high school. That's where my my wife teaches out of this room. Children that live in Taconi. God bless. And uh, so then you graduate high school. Where do you go? So, uh, so actually, my my career started um, as I entered uh, high school. Really? Yeah. So, so I'm I'm not like a funny person. I'm just like a guy. But um, I'm like, just a guy. Yeah, but, but like, you are, I, don't knock yourself, Justin. You're very funny. You're a song and dance man. I like Tony Danza. Well, that, well, that's <laughs> kind, of, kind of it. Yeah, you know, he actually he taught it. He taught at a high school in Northeast Philly for a while. Samantha. That's right. <laughs> Andrew. Mom. If you, if you, I swear to God, if my kids come up because they're about to get up to get ready for bed, I'm gonna have them come in, and all you have to do is ask them who's the boss. Okay. You go, who's the boss at your house? And they'll all look at you and go, Tony Danza. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they, they think you're crazy if you're like, is your dad the boss? Like, no, Tony Danza's yeah. the boss. You, you did right. You did yeah. well with, with your kids. Well I got to give you credit. I can't wait. I, to I just told my friend that I, he's from New Hampshire. He's a, he's a lot older than me. Um, when I get drunk and like I'm at a gig, when I come home, I buy toys for the kids, and I don't want to be like, I brought home cute toys. So I set them up downstairs. I don't wrap them. I don't do nothing, and I made up a fake holiday, and I have this. <laughs> I told him Sewer Bear shows up when he's not hanging with Hollywood elite. Sewer Bear shows up and brings presents to nerds. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're like, Sewer Bear brought these daddies. Is this for real? Is this a real thing? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, super. <laughs> That's amazing. And I have a feeling my kids are going to be in therapy while I'm alive. They're going to be telling their kids and their friends in school about sewer bear. What, you never heard of them? You never heard of sewer? But as soon as I die and they're older, they're going to go, God, I miss him. He was nuts. Do you leave brown shit stains and footprints on the floor? Paw print shit stains? <laughs> when they, when they leave. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> God, I mean, don't do that. Please. I made the whole thing up because a friend of mine has a, a bear suit and he like wears it all the time, but it it's a really bad bear suit, so it looks so we said it looks like a sewer bear. <laughs> <laughs> Just we were hitting a little too close. To I that. know he disappeared. He, he had to go. <laughs> you know, twice on this show, my computer crashed and I disappeared. It's so, your show, and so they had to just keep going. But now, just they they kept going. One one show, the last one we did, I froze in this position, <laughs> while the other two continued the conversation. <laughs> you see me in the box like this. <laughs> Jason, are you okay, Jason? <laughs> it was it was freaking <laughs> hilariously mortifying. I loved right, well, it. I can't continue with his story, so now I want to know yours. So you grew up in Jersey. <laughs> you know... Did you grow up in Cherry Hill? I, I do. Well, I'm Jewish, so... Yes. That's where they, yeah, that's where you they keep... To. When you first come to New Jersey, it's like Ellis Island. Yeah. You got to stop in Cherry Hill and get, you know... 
Go up past the diner. Get bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you grew up in Cherry Hill. I grew up in the Sea Hill, yes. And the then, east side, east side of Cherry Hill. East side Cherry Hill, those are some rough streets. And Yeah. Uh, so you got street cred. You – you got the street cred. You're from Ohio. You're blue collar badass. <laughs> We're hillbilly. Where hillbilly meets the redneck. Yes. Down Ohio. They both and, then, are. and then there's Justin who grew up in Northeast Philly and became an opera singer. This is a natural progression. There he is. There he is. Justin's back. back. We, we thought we offended you with the sewer bear comment. <laughs> that was his. That was his confirmation name, which is weird. <laughs> Sewer bear. The same Just, same sewer bear. <laughs> so, so Jason's grown up in Cherry Hill. He's building his street cred. You're in Northeast Philly. You graduate, but you're doing comedy in high school, or you're no. the guy. Again, I'm not. A, I'm. I'm actually not. You're a, not a comic. I'm you're just a funny guy. guy. I just look funny. Uh, Is there a way you could show him your Freddie? What you do? Can you show what? I don't want to put you on the spot, but do well, Freddie now. Well, here's the thing: is I, actually Freddie is not what I've done. I spent most of my 20 year career as an opera singer, uh, touring really? in Europe. So I'll, I'll do that real quick for you. I'll do, I'll do a little ukuleleing with uh, I'll, I'll, my quasi Italian mandolin that I have going on here. <laughs> Wow. Anybody, anybody else hungry for spaghetti? <laughs> I am like ready to eat. A nice that big was, meatball. That <laughs> was that. So now or never. Now with Elvis. That did was it for real? Wait, what was that? Or, was that it's now, it's now, now or never? never. True, oh, yeah, he did. he did. It's now or never. Come hold me tight. So that was. <laughs> oh my God, I've dude! You need, a, you need a black pencil thin mustache <laughs> and a striped shirt <laughs> and and a and like a a boater. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, dude. Oh, so man. you're you're singing? Were you like you're you're silly, like off? But the, you sing very serious. Well, so uh, so yeah, so I started. Uh, well, I was 11 years old when my voice changed. So I've sounded like this pretty much since I was 13 years old. Oh my god! And that's you had to intimidate every kid in your class. <laughs> um, but I was weird. I, I went to I went to a special music school, so everyone was was musically inclined. You know, from fifth grade through 12th grade, and uh, but I was just really weird, and I, I progressed really early. And so I was 13 years old when I went on my first European tour through Germany and France. And uh, it was all downhill from there. I mean, I peaked when I was like 22. What do you do now, man? You know, like I was 15 years old the first time I sang at Carnegie Hall. So it's like, you know what? Okay. Wow. Now you're doing this show with me and Mark. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I like that you're, you think it's sad that you peaked at 22. I was a has been that never did. <laughs> Well, Mark, you started. Did you start out as a comic? Or did you start out as a book or at Stand Up New York? So it kind of both happened at the same time. I worked at a comedy club and I was an actor, and then I was like, eh, I think I want to do this. And it just so <laughs> happened I was working at a comedy club, so it was easy. Like a lot of people have these like horrible, struggling stories, and I, I kind of was like, I think I want to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> I got it, but J so Jason, you're you're touring Europe. Jason's in Little Israel, Cherry Hill, <laughs> and so Jason, what did you do? You graduate high school. I graduated high school, and I took advantage of my freedom and didn't go to college. I went for a little bit as an English major. Yeah, and 
Then I went to the, and it was 1998, the year of our Lord, when I went to the Academy of Com- Comedy, Inst- American Comedy Institute. It was taught by Steven Rosenfeld and Mary Domino. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So, a few years later. That's right. Yeah, you came in and did a, a showcase show. I did. I Caroline, I forced myself because that was. I never got on stage. I was always shy. I struggled with stage fright so bad because I'm neurotic as it is. So being up on stage, I figured, you know what? I'm, I'm going to die one day. I have to not be all talk. I knew too many people that said, I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to do that. And yeah. I said, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. So, so I, you started taking classes. I saw an ad in the Village Voice. The graduation show was at Caroline's. And I thought, what a great place to do my first gig. Yeah. I started taking classes and they don't teach you how to be funny. They teach you how to structure an act, basically. A lot of people get confused when they say, How do you do a comedy class? You can't learn how to be funny. But you you use that to your full advantage, I think. That that shyness and the awkwardness. Like I did I I did, but you know, it was Dina Blizzard who really helped you did too, actually. I'll bring it out because People would say you're funnier off stage than you are on stage. So I just kind of transferred that character, just a heightened version of my own personality now. So then so then when did you start to you started working at Rascals? Was that after you already started doing comedy? Was it that was, yeah. Rascals opened in two thousand three, two or three, I think, in Cherry Hill. So you were doing and a little Samantha. I heard a kid. Duke, who's the boss? <laughs> Let's see if he comes rushing in. <laughs> but I got to watch with him. He'll, I was in the middle oh. of a Zoom meeting, and he came in and mooned everyone. <laughs> oh, no. Thankfully, I mean, he's three years old, so there was no trouble. You know what I mean? It's not, do any, this will be recorded, so I don't want any kitty porn on me. I'll just take a seat. <laughs> You have to start meeting your neighbors and telling them you're on a list. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, this like, are edit. <laughs> say, did you, are you a touchy? You're like, no, I just have a podcast. <laughs> I have a podcast, and this guy came on. His kid thought it was funny to moon me. <laughs> we were at dinner once with my in laws, and Duke looks over. I have my two kids, though, older one, he's uh, six, he's Axel. And then my little one, the four year old's Duke. And we're sitting at the dinner table, and everybody's in such a good mood. And Duke just turns to my father and I goes, Pop, Pop, I love my penis. <laughs> <laughs> Atta boy. I don't Atta think he boy. takes after Angie. I think this is your boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Dude, he's nuts. <laughs> So you start doing comedy. You're working in Cherry Hill. I went to Rascals. I, I wanted to see it because it opened up, and I haven't been to a comedy club in years. And I was so, I mean, just to watch a show. And I thought, this is, I don't have to go to New York. This is Cherry Hill. This is so much closer. And I go in, and Jerry Pontones was there from hey, Stand Up New York. Up used to be, yeah. From, and we took a double take, and I was like, what are you doing here? He said, this is my club now. He was a VP of entertainment, I think. Yeah. And we talked, and then Chris Clayton was manager, and I That's, got I the job it. as a tour man. Chris is awesome. Yeah. And what about, eventually what Chris didn't want to do it anymore, so I became the general manager. I just kind of got grandfathered in as general manager of the club. But I didn't really want to perform, so I went a number of years without performing because I didn't want to be the general manager – and have to be in manager mode and then bomb on stage and have to be a manager after that. <laughs> no respect. I did that. I <laughs> <laughs> stayed oh, yeah. in New York. Well, I actually, though, I, I would give myself a little bit of credit. I would only take, I, I kind of invented the check spot because I would only give myself the worst spots on the show. So it was like the MC didn't want to go up and eat it. So I was like, oh, that's when I'll go on. So nice. while they're paying their checks, I was like, I'll go on. I don't care if I bomb. What am I going to do? Not book myself? You know. So I would go up, and I didn't care if I did well. And um, the uh, I, the MCs loved it because that was the end of the night. They have to go up and bomb for 10 minutes while people are paying checks. So and you invented the check spot. 
I, I don't know if I invented that it. That would be I amazing. Feel like I did. I feel like I did because like there wasn't a term for it. I remember the MCs would always bitch about it, not yeah. wanting to do it. And I'm like, well, then I'll just go up and I'll do it. And as soon as I would tell the one waiter, as soon as the checks get to a certain point, like me, I'll get off stage. And then the MC, by the time they bring up the last comic, the checks will be in. So that's actually a brilliant idea for you to do that. <laughs> it's a I great mean, way to work your get your crowd work skills up and going. And, well, and it's like if you can do good, then when you go up on a regular show, it's like, yeah, oh, exactly. yeah, how they're listening. This is <laughs> yes. So, so you're you're do not performing now. You're working. Um, when did was, Sweaty Eddie come in, or was he at the other rest? It was there. He was the, the um, head of uh, director of entertainment, or well, I forget his title. Yeah. He managed. He managed the uh, the room in Montclair. Okay, that's sweaty okay. Eddie. Sweaty Eddie. In uh, so now, Justin, you're going overseas. Yeah, you're singing. Yeah, I was doing the thing. Uh, when I graduated high school, I started to study at University of the Arts because I uh, I realized that I didn't want to necessarily be a, an opera singer all the time. So I was doing what we call crossover singing. So oh, I was doing, I was playing nightclubs in a band, you know, doing top 40 stuff. I, I had a small what big band. What did you do in the band? Singing. What did you do in the band? Sing or were you playing instruments? I was originally uh, hired into the this 11-piece horn band as the trombone player. Really? Yeah. And so they're like, oh, this dude can sing too. So then they had me sing some tunes. And uh, so I was doing a little bit of everything with that group. I was with them for about... Gosh, uh, eleven years, wow. and uh, doing the the nightclub circuit in the uh, in the tri-state area here, the Philadelphia metropolitan area, and uh, I was doing that, and I was you know between doing that and doing opera and doing musical theater and big band and all that, uh, the the career just kind of went kind of uh, kind of wild. It, it, I, I currently work in a group called Thirty Three and a Third Lives Killer Queen Experience. Cool. Yeah, where I'm the lead singer, and so I we 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 say that you know we're we don't we don't imitate we recreate. So I'm not jumping around on stage like Freddie Mercury. You do a really nice job as Freddie, though. I gotta oh. tell you that. Well, you know I'm over 300 pounds, so I look more like uh, Freddie Jupiter or Meatloaf. Please, <laughs> a Meatloaf. I look like the full Boston Market menu. Are you kidding? <laughs> 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 so, but, uh, but the whole idea of the of the band, where you know most tribute acts, they go up and they try to you know represent the band live on know. stage. We recreate the uh, the studio recordings, so we're uh, we're eleven people on stage. So we do all the live vocals. You're about the sound. Yeah, yeah, and so it's one of those kind of uh, those close your eyes moments, and you can just feel you. So you're not going there with an open shirt or shirtless like Freddie does. <laughs> not intentionally. <laughs> I had, and then I'm going to say a word that I don't like saying, um, but I went to see Queen in Philly when I first moved down here with Angie. And it was uh, Angie, me, and James Stipendetto, and Teddy Daniels. And we all go to see Queen, and it's the real band, but it's with Adam Lambert. Oh, yeah. And he was great. Like, I was digging every second of the show. I love Queen. Just absolutely love Queen. And I have to go to the bathroom, and I'm really kind of – I'm angry that I have to go to the bathroom because I don't want to miss anything. And I run down – and this – you know, it's one of these shows where they're showing, you know, the guitar player playing, and then it fades into, you know, them back in the day. And, you know, so it's like a very pulling your heartstrings of, like – remember who they were and all this stuff and i'm in the bathroom pissing and, and the most philly guy on the planet comes in i'm the only guy in the bathroom because nobody wants to leave the room water's done um <laughs> oh that was laura dumping a bucket <laughs> she gave herself a foot bath yes ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so i uh I'm sitting there at the urinal, and this guy comes in, looks at me, and he goes, "Man, this show sucks." And I'm like, kind of. He's like, "This fag's ruining Queen," and I'm like, "What?" That's the most Philly moment I've ever like. He doesn't even get oh the irony. God. 
of the like, name of the band. It's like <laughs> or the flamboyance of Freddie Mercury. Like, yeah. I know Freddie I just had a swish about him. Oh man, this piano <laughs> makes this piano guy really made Liberace look gay. <laughs> <laughs> terrible there was just this moment of me just like am i being punked like <laughs> what <laughs> like, like that's a huge philly moment right there yeah. what part of freddie mercury did you think was knee deep in pussy like, <laughs> oh, he, he, did, he did enjoy cats <laughs> That would be the only movie he was knee deep in. <laughs> Where can we see some of the band? Like, can we go online and that? That's actually uh, um, what are are you? Is this your show? Because I mean, I, I I feel like he's interviewing. Well, this is a special us. show where Mark is interviewing us. Well, no, that's what I said. I said I'm I'm about to interview you guys because wait, wait I before, you, before you do that, you were when you said you were in the bathroom at the concert. I I. Was at an Almond Brothers show. My friend, this guy, I don't know if he's alive or dead now. This guy, Tom Dodson, was mental over the Almond Brothers and insisted we go. He took us, it was the spectrum to see the Almond Brothers years ago in Philadelphia. And the show just started. He said, I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the bathroom. An hour later, he comes back and he's got no shirt on and no socks. He's just got jeans and shoes. I'm like, what the fuck happened to you? Where were you? And when he went to the bathroom, he's sitting in the stall. First of all, you never go in the stall at a concert venue, ever. If you can hold it in, he must not have been able to hold it in. But he's there. He's in the stall, pants around the ankles. The door bursts open. A guy throws up all over his legs and his underwear, falls face down in his pants. <laughs> and the door's open. Oh, <laughs> People see this guy face down in the underwear. And security comes and the cops come. And he's like, can you guys shut the door, please? So, uh, pull this guy out of here. They're like, you want to press charges? Yeah, I want to press charges. Oh, my God. And they're all talking to him. And he, poor guy's on the toilet with his pants around his ankles trying to clean up. I don't know why your bathroom door reminded me of that. <laughs> I was born a rambling man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Since we're telling that... concert stories, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a relatively quick one. Uh, I, I I used to work with uh, the, in the chorus at uh, Opera Philadelphia, and uh, I was doing uh, a production, and I was talking to a buddy of mine, Steve, and he was uh, telling me about. <laughs> uh, uh, we were talking about like doing our our war stories and such, and he was telling me, well, you know, one day I was going to the Dave Matthews Band concert over in Camden. And uh, we were all, me and my buddies were getting in line and my buddy cut in front of me. And uh, like we were all like hustling because we were, you know, we could hear that the opening act was ending and we didn't want to miss Dave. And, you know, and I, I tripped and my buddy turned around too quick and my hands were back. I couldn't catch myself and I hit my jaw on the curb and, oh. I, and I broke my jaw and it popped. Very American History X. Very much so. He curved himself. Oh, and, oh my god! And he was an opera singer, so like he was like, so I had to have my chain, my 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 wall, my wi uh, my my jaw wired, and all of that. And uh, I had to say, it's like, man, you oh. tell people that you were going to a Dave Matthews concert. Ooh, <laughs> I have a very Ohio moment at a concert. What is that? It was, uh, I believe, it was Farm Aid. And so Dave Matthews was on, and there was like, he wasn't playing yet. Somebody else was on stage, and a fight broke out. And this like dude bro comes out, and he's just like, hey, man, let's all just smoke a bone, and listen to some Dave Matthews. And all get and in the middle of his sentence, he just got hit in the face with a rock. So, <laughs> 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 That's Ohio. <laughs> that was the guy's trying to, you know, make peace, and some hillbilly just was like, "Fuck that! Get David Allen Co out here." That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he did say he, he just wanted them to get stoned. <laughs> oh, I didn't wow. even think of that angle. I didn't Great even think angle. Of that yes, angle. Oh, that's brilliant. Leave it to the Christian to make it biblical. That's beautiful, Justin. <laughs> 
<laughs> Re Reverend Gonzalez here, yeah. <laughs> so then, Jason, you started, you got back into it. Got back. I into did. It. I, I, prefer, I always preferred acting. Yeah. It was, that's where I, I was going to go next. Yeah, in 2002, right before I started at Rascals, I did my first community theater show. Uh, a well, friend of mine was doing The Elephant Man, and it, one of the pallbearers couldn't make it. And they needed a guy for a few scenes. You, you've you had stage experience? Come be in The Elephant Man. So I did, and I did such a good job as the pallbearer. The director said, I'm auditioning for Our Town in Haddonfield next week. Why don't you come? I want you to come read. So I was Howie Newsom, the milkman, who incidentally was also played by William H. Macy. So you not the same show, but same well, character. I was excited that I had the same part as William H. Macy in one show. I could definitely see you playing his part. But With a square him. head, this freaking <laughs> I'm cooperating here. I look, you want a lock count? Fine, I'll get you a darn lock count. You're darn tootin'. <laughs> I, did you ever see the movie The Cooler? Love that movie. That's you. He got naked and banged. Uh, what's her name? Maria Bello. Maria Bello, yes. Yeah. He used to wait tables with Bernadette Pauly. Really? Yes. Anybody listening would have no idea what my reference is. <laughs> Unless you're a comedian and know Bernadette Pauly. Yeah. Or you're Al Duchon. <laughs> Just so, that they're comedians. They're a comedian couple, Bernadette and Al. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so you start getting back into acting, and you're messing with stand up, but you're doing some acting, dabbling here and there, dabbling in theater, going back and forth. And you would think I would talk more like Justin. Yeah. Doing being a thespian. Well, I was in. I did do Carnegie Hall at 21 years old. <laughs> so Justin, you're doing the band. Yeah, yeah. You're running around with the band. Are you still messing with acting? Are so you... I, I, I was doing voice acting a little bit, and uh, and uh, so I, I kind of went away from doing uh, live theater. Uh, I still do a lot of uh, concertizing with orchestras uh, in the region. Is that a uh, word? Concertizing. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. You didn't just make that up. I did not just make it up. It's a thing. All right. So does Miriam Webster. What? I said, and I said, I promise, and so does Miriam Webster. So I don't know this Miriam, but um so. But I'll take her word for it. Is Miriam Webster on Facebook? Because I'll find her and confirm uh, this. They're they're just the, the dictionary people. So there's oh, I want to before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to one of our favorite listeners. Oh, we have listeners in England, Mark. Yeah, well, of course, because they're wondering where your accent is. <laughs> like, How did he shed that accent? He sounds like he's from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. <laughs> he does a great American accent. <laughs> you know, I was I was in um an cow, Irish brown cow. Brown, brown cow. <laughs> I took a lot of the rain in Spain is mainly on the plain. Tip of the tongue. And <laughs> I was at an Irish pub watching this Irish band and I was chatting with a friend and this girl came up to me. She said, where are you from? And I said, Cherry Hill. She says, oh, never mind. I thought you were from Ireland. <laughs> she was, I, I, I should have just lied. If I would have known ahead of time, I would have lied. I would have had a great night. Diddly, 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 diddly. Yeah, Cherry Hill, Ireland. Oh, I'm wearing the laddie <laughs> shirt, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you are wearing a very Irish shirt, are you? Yeah. But you're married now, Mark. Yeah. Well, she would take one look at me and go, well, that guy needs to do a sit-up. Mark, you're a good-looking dude. <laughs> what does your wife call you, the Fat Paul Rudd? The Fat Paul Rudd. <laughs> I see it. I, you know, I get Seth Rogen now all the time. You get Seth Rogen. Yeah, people say that I sound. I was thinking but, Joe Rogan. I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> Seth Rogan. I can see you, you got the voice of voice of Seth Rogan, the face of Paul Rudd. There you go. I like that compliment. You're I'll an Apatow mashup. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Son of Apatow. There it is. <laughs> That's your act. That was the Tolkien version. 
<laughs> Did you see that show that uh, Kieran Culkin's in, where they basically are like the Disney family or the Murdochs? No, what's that? Really, it's on HBO. It was so good. They're like the richest family in the world, and they're like really fucking evil. <laughs> it's really good. Really? Like, Is it based on real people or just fictional? It's fictional, but like there's hints of like, oh yeah, I think didn't that family go through that? But the uh, Karen Culkin looks like skinny Josh Petrino. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're this is gonna be a show we reference people no one knows. There's but. just there's gonna be links in the inform in the, the information of the video. Just be like just go to this wiki page. I wish I had a picture of Josh saved so we can um <laughs> Did you guys catch the Emmys? We were watching. I wanted to, but we got really hooked on Dateline episodes on YouTube to catch a predator. <laughs> so open to see some old friends. <laughs> it's like that's my demo reel, man. Come on, <laughs> that's how it starts. Why don't you take a seat? Wait, are we are we on TV? You're Chris Hansen. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> Can I? Are we? Are we gonna? Is this gonna be on TV? Can I use this for my reel? <laughs> is it SAG? Do <laughs> <laughs> I need to sign a waiver? No, this is a news program. You don't have to sign a waiver. Perfect, perfect. Just at least send me a copy. Let me know when it airs. <laughs> I want to get some exposure. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> there was. Uh, it was interesting because. It came on, and I was doing something last night, and I was with uh, Tom Briscoe and Kevin Downey Jr., and um, we were we were filming something for a uh, like an industrial video, and um, there was uh, the Emmys came on, and it opened with with uh, with him in front of a live audience, and he was like getting laughs, and they were cutting to the audience. And Tom was getting really pissed because he's like, this isn't live. This isn't live. And I go, I think that's part of the joke. It's like he's crushing. Oh. Like he's crushing. I, it on YouTube. I was confused. Okay. <laughs> and then he like, at one point they like turn the lights on and you see he's actually in a completely empty theater, like a gigantic empty theater. But uh, it was really weird watching. And um and uh, Shit's Creek cleaned up. And oh, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but Shit's Creek cleaned up, and I'm. Oh, I was, they did. I saw that. I was thinking to you. Show. I'm like, he should have been in that show. You would have wow. been a good character on that show, dude. You are so complimentary. The last show we did, John Reynolds was. We were talking about their parrot. <laughs> and how it's very complimentary, but I was like, yeah, but that's not very motivational to have a parrot. You're doing good. You're a professional. <laughs> the voice would kill the whole thing, but you're, you've got a natural voice and you're complimentary. Oh, well, there you go. more than the parrot. Yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> now, do you remember Josh Petrino and I called you one night? You had like a show and we were coming back from a show and we called you and we we're like, dude, we heard. You're like, what? What was that all about? Yeah. <laughs> we're just like, let's call Jason and tell him there's a rumor going around that he shit on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so we call him. We're like, it's completely fine, man. You know, like, people aren't even going to be talking about it in a week or two. And like, we were trying to be, like, super supportive. And he's like, what are you talking about? We're like, we know. You can just tell us. And like we heard it like you were so convincing. <laughs> it started to get annoying. Like, who's starting this rumor? Should I just go with it? He's like, love it's on SNL. It was acting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget we were on the phone. We had you on speaker and we're like, we might be able to talk him into thinking you really did. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. I didn't know until all this until now. Yeah. <laughs> we, were trying, we were trying so hard to get you to be like, okay, I did it. I did it. 
I know when I shit on stage. And that was not one of those times. <laughs> we kept saying, like, you wore high socks and stuff, right? So when it dripped down, it would soak it up. <laughs> God. <laughs> You've done a lot for comics, Mark. You really have. What's his name? Josh? Not Josh. Uh, oh, my God. I can't remember his name. And he lives near me. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. He's a nice guy. He looks like a hamburger in his face. <laughs> I can't think of his oh, name. Mikey it. Hamburger Face. Oh, yeah. Mikey hamburger. Oh, hamburger. <laughs> Both people who, if, if somebody's not in comedy and they say it's a mutual friend on Facebook, I can just look up our mutual friends. You and I have like 600 mutual friends or something yeah, like that. Same up with all the same. Comics. Are you talking about Josh, uh, Joshua? Um, can't think of his last name. His name. Josh. Yeah, dude. I, I, I. He looks like the dad from uh, Josh Ryan. Josh Ryan. Yeah, he looks like the dad from um, from Fonzie. Happy days. It's Richie Cunningham. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I kept calling him Tom Fonzie. He's like, shut up. Oh wow! That's right. <laughs> Every time he'd post on Facebook, I'd put a picture. Of <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> I think at some point he blocked me. And we're friends. He loves you, man. <laughs> he's he's such a good guy. He got attacked by a dog. Here's an Ohio moment. We went to go get cigars. We had a night off, and he got attacked by a dog at a cigar shop. <laughs> like, almost he looks good. like a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a hamburger. <laughs> and that dog said it got funny. He goes, I know I'm not supposed to, but uh, I'll regret if I don't try. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, that's a that's a tr my jazz trio. That's the the little big band lounge revival. You know who's in that band? Mark was the flute player from the Hustle. The flute player, dude. The Hustle. He's my piano player. Yeah. Does, is it me, or do you just want to dunk paint rollers into a can and just start painting your penis to that song? <laughs> well, you, well, you're no, just like, just me. Okay. <laughs> Never gonna have to. Never gonna listen to that song and sing it again. <laughs> well, see, I never say. I never say do the hustle. I say pay my penis. <laughs> I do. I pay my penis. <laughs> we had a teacher in high school that I used to say. I saw him doing that through the mirror, uh, window at the school. But I looked in. What? He had a. He had a. Uh, a pilot cap, like the old fashioned pilot cap, no clothes, and he had two neon paint cans and just do, 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 do. obviously everyone knew I was kidding, but it was the funniest <laughs> visual on the planet. I really thought you saw this, Mark. I thought you were in this big can. You were see, that's how good an actor you are. You were so good. <laughs> I, I miss Danny Ayala's room. He had uh, that great room in Hoboken. You were like the king of that room. No. You, you were. He gave you his phone number. <laughs> you would walk in and he'd just be like, Jason! He used to say, "Good." he'd pinch your cheek. Good job, kid. Good stuff. <laughs> it was like the closest. He was one of the nicest people. To the mob. Oh, yeah. No, it really was. was. Like, we hey, there so when the get some pasta for you. Were you there the night he got into a – was it him? No, no. It was the owner. Had a fight with somebody. No. Kicked him out. The, like the owner who was older than Danny was yelling at some guy. And it, if Scorsese was directing it, the whole place would have been shot up. It was like the closest <laughs> I've seen to a real-life Goodfellas moment. Get the fuck out of my restaurant. No, you don't understand. Get out. I don't know what what the subject matter was or what was happening. <laughs> Josh was there. I remember it was <laughs> the Josh Petrino that the Josh Petrino. all our listeners know. There is there are two moments in that room that I'll never forget, and you had to do with both of them. One was every single person went up and bombed. Every single act went up. 
and yeah, Bob, that sounds about right. Jason goes up and he starts crushing with this one table. There was one table and they loved them. And the guy was wearing like one of those like puffy vests. And Jason just turns to the only guy laughing, turns to him and was like, Yeah, love the northern exposure. <laughs> you attacked oh, it's right. it like John Corbett. Yeah, you attacked every single person, or like let the, every person who is being shitty let them go. You attacked the one person who was enjoying the show. <laughs> they, they were my friends. I figured I could get away. They weren't my friends, but they were laughing. Yeah, I figured like, they liked me. I could get away with it. Josh and I are in the corner. Howling, just howling, laughing, <laughs> and the other ones you got, you got heckled by like some crazy like old German lady or something. That sounds vaguely familiar. It, it, it was like you were doing great, but the one lady just had this mug on her, like, you know, <laughs> would not smile, and you said something to her, and then she like. And only as an old person can do. She like totally burned you, like with a like a horrible heckle that was just like coming from like an old angry German woman. Like you're just not funny. <laughs> and you were just like she was upset because I was Jewish, and, and <laughs> I, at the time I was the center of attention. And old Jews, old Germans don't like that. Oh, but there was just this moment. Is wrong? Is that offensive? <laughs> This old German battle axe just <laughs> I just don't think you're funny. <laughs> Why keep it to herself? Why not just let everybody know? Yeah. She she had a, a mug on her though. She looked like throw mama from the train. You know that lady? Yes. I can't remember her name, but I know who you're talking Sam about. Sam Kennison and Drag. <laughs> Provenza, who's good friends with Gilbert, but I didn't know Gilbert, so I wanted to have an in with him. And I go, um, I, I basically through the grapevine between Fugel saying Provenza and all these guys, they basically said, like, the way to Gilbert's heart is food, and he's notoriously cheap. So I, I go, Hey, Gilbert, uh, I'm here with my family. Uh, my wife and kids are with me tomorrow afternoon. We're going to go to lunch. This place is amazing. Uh, it's on me. Like, just come down and we'll we'll get it's some of the best Italian food you'll ever have. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, okay. So the next day, I realized I never gave him my phone number. I never get, I got, I didn't have his. So I'm going, I don't even, I can't call the front desk and go, give me Gilbert Gottfried's room. So I'm sitting there talking to my wife. I'm like, I have no idea what to do. Like I was really hoping to get lunch with Gilbert. All of a sudden, the hotel room phone rings. I pick it up, and it's Gilbert going, I'm inquiring about the free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the greatest. And then he got in the car, and everybody told me, they're like, don't be offended. He doesn't talk to anybody. He never talks to people. Like, he's just real quiet and shy and backward. You know, whatever. It's not, don't take it personal. We get in the car. He's talking to my kids the entire drive, asking Angie questions about where she works, what she does, wanting to know what the kids like. He probably, I saw him at Larry Storch's birth, one of one of Larry Storch's birthday parties. He came with his family, and he was really a nice person, very shy and timid, and he just all about his family, though. So yeah. that's probably what it was. You had your kids, you felt comfortable. It was funny, so. We ended up like having a great week, and I got along with him really well. Then at the end, he has to put his bags in the car that's taking him back to the Berkshires. So I bring my suitcase, or I bring his suitcases down to go put them in the car because his suitcases are bigger than him. He's tiny. He's a tiny man. And as I'm putting them in, he goes, "The kids aren't going to come down and say bye." <laughs> oh, that's awesome! So I had to call Angie, like, "Bring the kids down. Gilbert wants to say bye." <laughs> How cool. <laughs> but I'm inquiring about the free lunch. <laughs> I, I've always wanted to meet Gilbert Gottfried. I just think he's such a great storyteller. I love the, the character that he's developed on stage. And now you've let me know I have to rent children. Yeah. Borrow mine. <laughs> borrow mine. They already are familiar with them. 
fantastic. <laughs> so he has two little kids. Mm -hmm. Like he has yes. no kids. And prevents it. <laughs> was telling me he goes up to goes up to Gilbert. It's the first time he saw him since he had the kids. And he goes, "Hey man, like tell me, are you are your kids funny?" And Gilbert goes, "I prefer their early work." <laughs> <laughs> How great is that line? <laughs> Who's the craziest person you work with, Justin, with the music? Oh, you don't have to say names. You can just tell us a good story. If you don't think they're going to watch it, you could say the name. <laughs> I, well, well, I'm on it, so they probably won't watch it. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I've, wor I've worked with some some interesting people that I never thought that I would ever work with. Um, like I, I sang at the uh, the last DNC when oh, it was I was nominated, and I was uh, I sang with Lenny Kravitz. Wow! And uh, he. Wow. Uh, and, and that's and that's I think is the weird thing is because sometimes like you meet people that are at that level and they're really warm and they're really giving of their time and their presence and then there's Lenny Kravitz. Oh shit! Um, yeah, it, like, <laughs> you could not get anywhere near him. That was just he was not that guy. Like I I performed with the Philadelphia Orchestra with Rod Stewart and I got to shake Rod Stewart's hand. And I, I didn't meet Rod Stewart, but I was in Detroit and met Fraud Stewart. The number one <laughs> impersonator, and the guy was the guy called himself Rod. Like when he would go out, he's like, he he "Call me Rod." Himself, yeah, I'm Rod, and everybody's like, "Are you Rod Stewart?" And he's like, "Good for him. Might as well. If you're going to be unfortunate enough to look like Rod Stewart, you might as well act like Rod Stewart." <laughs> <laughs> he did not. He did not let up one bit to like letting people know, like, oh no, I, I'm in a band that we do Rod Stewart music. He was like, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I'm not divulging that information right now. Did he have an English accent? Yeah, he put on an English accent when we went out. Nice. He was a hardcore Detroit boy when we were interviewing him. That's funny. That's <laughs> great. Is that there's going to be someone that was at that bar, like, dude. Fucking Rod Stewart. I was fucking drinking my Michelob and uh, <laughs> over fucking Rod Stewart for forever young Maggie May man and he's over there just fucking drinking a suds. What the fuck? I remember going to see David Byrne at the Electric Factory and I was in line behind this guy getting a pizza. We got a slice of pizza. We both walked up to watch this Latin Cuban fusion jazz band. That was um, they were awesome. Nobody paid attention at first, but they started playing. They sounded phenomenal. I, I wish I remembered their name. But we went up there, and me and this guy were eating pizza, watching the band. And I, I just happened to glance at the guy who's been next to me eating pizza this whole time. It was fucking David Byrne. <laughs> oh my God. And he decides, like, the band's about to wrap up, so he starts to go backstage. And this dude next to me says, Dude, you missed your shot. Really? Was he going to make me a star? Yeah, I don't know what was hey, gonna happen. I was wondering if you wanted to stand in for me tonight. I don't have the night off. You know our songs, right? <laughs> so, I was gonna say probably the the coolest uh, like experience I had was at that same concert. John Lithgow was there singing. No and, way. Yeah, and I was. I, I thought I told you the story, Jason. No. I was, I was I in the hallway. I was in the hallway on my way down to the stage because I was a uh, part of the group that was going up to sing with Rod, and Lithgow was running up to his dressing room, and he tripped, and I reached out and I caught him. I wish like love at first sight. That's how romantic you, comedy starts. Absolutely, it was a meet cute. <laughs> All of a sudden, George Michael Last Dance started playing. <laughs> <laughs> Stare in each other's eyes. Thank you. But it, was, it, was, it, was funny thing. it was a beat. John Lithgow looked up and he goes, "That could have been terrible," and then continued to run up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, you, John Lithgow. You almost curb stomped John Lithgow as well. <laughs> it's a, I have a pattern. <laughs> John Lithgow, or as we call him on the podcast, Tall Jason Pollock. That's so weird. <laughs> the forehead, yes. John Lithgow is that's an interesting dude. 
He can do comedy. He Dexter, can do he was such a twisted, twisted oh. guy, Dexter. Yeah. He was an evil him. serial killer in that series. You look at that character, and then fast forward like a couple years later, he's playing uh, Will Ferrell's dad in That's Daddy's right. Home too. <laughs> it's like <laughs> this guy can do it all. He and played a transgender in Garp, Robin right. Williams movie, and he's a hell of a singer too. I mean, he was in the original Broadway cast of uh, uh, what is it, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels? That's yes, right. Justin, can you get him for the show? Um. <laughs> sure. <laughs> hey, John, remember that time you don't say who? <laughs> Mark, tell me about drinks, jokes, and storytelling. So, uh, my the podcast that I do with Richie Byrne, and we have to have you both on. You both have to come on. You have to come in studio. Uh, we'd love we to. We do it in Eatontown, New Jersey, at a shared universe with uh, the comic book men. Really? You know, well, I mean, they're not on our show, but they produce it. And oh, wow. um, it, and it's Richie and I, and our favorite thing in the world is sitting, like, after a show being in the green room, when you're just the, like, the, the part of the night where the lights are on in the nightclub, and it's the performers yeah. waiting to get paid. That is always the best part of the show. We're just trying like to recreate that, like, we're just bullshitting, telling old jokes. You know, like we we make each person that comes on has to tell a street joke and tell us what their favorite drink is. I love so that kind of starts it. But sometimes people come on. Like the other day, I was thinking of you, Jason. Um, we had uh, Buddy Fitzpatrick, and he was just Buddy. on. And Buddy, instead of telling a street joke, just started telling about um, when he saw Kevin Meany do this one joke. So he reenacted Kevin Meany's joke. And then we just talked about Kevin Meany for like an hour. You he's know, it was like, he's the best. We had all these other things we wanted to talk about, but it was like that's all of a sudden Kevin, Kevin got brought up, and then it was like, that's what we're talking about the rest of the show. Yeah. And then, so, Mark, you've got, you've got to let me know. So what is a street joke? Because remember, I'm, I'm a – Oh, so street joke is just a joke anybody can tell. You know, like a guy walks into a bar – Ah. Guy's at his doctor and says, "Where you know, where when you go to see a stand-up comic, it's usually about their real life or like an observation that's original." It's but not a street joke. joke. These yeah. are jokes like a uh, your blue-collar friend will tell you, or your office friend will tell. Oh, you're a comedian. Yeah, you can use this one. <laughs> I love when people say that. I always listen. Yeah. And the worst. Oh, I, I listen. Better. Sometimes it's painful to have to fake that laugh, but oh, I, sometimes I, it's funny. Really yeah, I I mean, dude, I've been surprised, but Paul Provenza said it, and it's what really inspired me. I used to hate when comics would tell street jokes with each other, and, uh, and then later I realized he said it's like jazz. You know, you can have a song, and you, Justin, you know this as a singer, like you can take a song and have two different artists play the song. You're gonna hit the same notes, but it's done differently. And yeah, a different yeah. perspective and a different feel. Like if I played, if I well, first of all I can't read music, but if I could, and I played the thrill is gone note by note, I could get through the song. But then if BB King played it, he'd be putting all that stank on it and all the things. So it's like, to me, watching a comic tell a joke is that same kind of analogy where it's like I want to see where they make it their style or their and you know sometimes they phone it in and just tell the joke and they think that's good enough but i want to i want like i want to hear jason tell the guy walks into a bar joke i want to hear jason do the aristocrats yes <laughs> well, i'll save that for when richie's on we'll all do our own version oh okay. i love that i love that <laughs> we could get paul on i'm he looking good. Paul, Paul, would Paul would do it. I bet he'd come on. Oh, that would be a, I love his Twitter page. It's so offensively <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Justin, if you get it, are you on Twitter? Because you need to follow the aristocrats page. I will I will I, you know what I might sign up for Twitter just for that then. It's it's pretty worth it. They find the most offensive, horrific tweets and then retweet them and they write their own as well 
it's um, it's it's not for the the faint, but it's it's good. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. The only one I don't know why was street jokes. I'm so bad because I can't think of any right now, except for um. <laughs> <laughs> this is me on stage whenever I try to do comedy. <laughs> um, this this doctor comes into the room and says to the guy, "He's he already screwed it up." <laughs> I'm a professional, damn it! I'll, I'll do my this joke. Goes, and start clean. How about that? This, wait, wait. This guy. The doctor comes in and says, sir, you're going to have to stop masturbating. Oh, my God, why? Because it's disturbing the other patients. <laughs> oh, I screwed that up so bad. No. <laughs> so, so Jason, I, 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 was, I was in the uh, comedy test kitchen in, like, the very, very early stages of that with Julia Scotti and Chris Rich and yes, yes. You know, all of them. And uh, we, we, all, we ran early. And so everyone was just like, just go up and just do do a joke, just like just your 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 set up your punchline joke, just your and we just revolved like that. And they said, oh, Justin, you do it too. I was like, I'm just here to sing the songs and just do this a little bit. So no, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. You gotta do it. Exactly what it was. Chris Rich, she go, she was like, you're funny. Go up, do something. And so I went up and uh, and this was my joke. I just uh, I asked everyone, well, what did Cinderella say when she got to the ball? <laughs> it keeps going. <laughs> oh my God. It's so good. <laughs> so um, this actor dies. He, he was an actor turned director, and he was he goes to heaven, and he's at the gates, and they go, okay, so. Uh, welcome to heaven, and we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we actually were thinking of shooting a film, but we were looking for a director, and you're our guy. And it's unbelievable. I mean, we have we have everybody. I mean, Orson Welles is going to be in it. We have Marlon Brando is going to be in it. We have, uh, uh, you know, most of the Golden Girls are going to do a little side thing to make it funny. And uh, we have the greatest orchestra of all time is going to play to do the soundtrack. The guy goes, oh, my God, this is great. And then St. Peter goes, wait, Jesus has a girlfriend, and she sings. <laughs> it took a second. <laughs> I was like, wait, did I do it wrong? <laughs> I just heard that one last night. So. <laughs> so it's fresh in your head. That's awesome. <laughs> you got me with one I never heard. That was impressive. That's good. <laughs> yeah. What do you call a tattoo? Or shit. Okay. What do you do? What do you do when a bass player shows up on your doorstep? <laughs> what? Hand him a twenty for the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, all right, Jason. This one's gonna be for you. World's worst actor. World's worst actor gets a job on Broadway. His agent calls him. He goes, "I got a job for you." He goes, "What?" He goes, "I got a job for you." He goes, "When's the audition?" He goes, "No audition. You got to get there now. You got to get to the Needlelander Theater and open the second act. The guy who's supposed to open the second act, he didn't show up. You got the job." Here's the thing. All you got to do is you go out and write to open the second act. You're going to go, hark, I hear the cannons roar. That's it. That's all you got to do. You'll be on Broadway. It's going to be amazing. It's going to blow your career up. He goes, oh, my God, I got to get there. So the guy's running to the theater across town. He's running. He's practicing. Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Hark, I hear the cannons roar. He gets in there. He walks up to the backstage door. He pounds. They open the door. Stage manager's like, oh, my God, you're the guy. They grab him. They bring him in. They throw a costume on him. They go, all right, go out. And when the curtains open, be ready. And he goes, I I'm ready. And he's standing there in the, the thing. Hark, I 
hear the cannon draw. Oh, I gotta hear the cannon draw. All of a sudden, the orchestra starts up. He goes out to the stage. The curtains open up, and from where the orchestra is, you hear cannons go off, and he goes, "What the fuck was that?" <laughs> Good acting joke. <laughs> <laughs> the string walks into a bar, and he says, "Cause they do. If they were pretend strings are alive." <laughs> And he drink. So this string goes into a bar and he says, I like a drink. And the bartender says, sorry, we don't serve string here. He's like, God damn it. I need a drink. Cause I had a really bad day. So <laughs> there's more. So <laughs> he gets an idea and he gets himself into this little loop and twists and turns and goes back in. And he said, Hey, I need a drink. And the bartender said, I thought I told you, Aren't you that string that was just here? And he said, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Jason, I love you. And John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a joke teller, per se. <laughs> Can I have that on a bumper sticker? <laughs> I'm not a joke teller, per se. Per se. <laughs> all right yeah. one more one more and then there's this really nice hotel and there's a chess convention in town do you know about this oh well there, <laughs> there's a chess convention in this really nice hotel and they were of course these chess people were really rowdy and the hotel manager said you guys gotta calm down because our other guests are complaining and you're being really out of line and they said, look, you're just a hotel manager. We're chess. We're the greatest chess players in the world. So you just go on about your business and let us do our thing. And the guy said, you don't do this. I'm calling the cops. He said, fine, call the cops, whatever. We don't care. We're chess champions. Mm -hmm. So the guy calls the police. The police come and said, all right, you guys got to get out of here. They're like, what is with you people? You're just a cop. We're the greatest chess players in the world. And he said, yeah, well, we don't like chestnuts boasting in an open foyer. <laughs> bum, bum, ba, bum. Wow. <laughs> Did I mention they were in the hotel lobby? Because that would have helped. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Jason, you're the funniest dude I know. Oh, stop. Oh. <laughs> Mark, thank you for being on the show. I, it was so good to reconnect. And I want to yeah. have you and Richie on together. That's cool. Yes, and we'll have you on ours. Actually, we, why don't we record it and make it a double? That would be a blast. Yeah. It would be a good time. 